Aloha. It's September the 1st, 2021. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. Time for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is 20-Year Afghanistan War Over, But It's Not. You know, it was uh, August 31st, 2021. We saw the last flight leave Kabul Airport. And that marked the end of the 20-year war that the United States was involved with. Not just the United States. We had coalition forces. Uh, this war in, encompassed many, many, many nations, not just the United States. Uh, it all began October 2001, called Enduring Freedom. But, you know, fast forward 20 years, and we have 2,469 U.S. troop lives lost, over 19,000 American soldiers wounded, some of them permanently, mentally. We had over 71,000 Afghan citizens killed. We had scores more wounded. We had over 177 Afghan national military and police killed. And at the end of 20 years, you have to say, what did we get out of this? What did we learn? And hopefully this nation and other nations, they're going to take a moment to reflect, that reflection point to say, what, what were we doing there? What was the mission? And how did we creep the mission creep off the initial mission? What was the original mission? It was to destroy Al-Qaeda and kill Osama bin Laden. That was it. Like Vietnam, it's going to take months, and hopefully, you know, we have COVID, we have the we have the voting rights, we have global global warming to contend with, and we need that time to still have a point of reflection to say what was it worth? Did we accomplish what we wanted to? And if we didn't, how are we going to learn from this? How are we going to learn from our mistakes? And with that, I go to my guests. Today we have Jay Fidel and Winston Welch. Welcome. Hey, Jay, um, you can't help but draw parallels on one, how we got into this war, like we did with Vietnam, how we had a very clear mission, but then over time, the mission crept. The, the, you know, it got foggy. We, we went from trying to destroy Al Qaeda and kill Osama and Bin Laden to now becoming a nation builder, uh, impose our style of democracy. How, what parallels do you see between the 20 years war in Afghanistan compared to Vietnam? A lot, a lot of parallels. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but largely they're the same. And it makes you think that, you know, since World War II, has, has the United States won a war? Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't win Korea, you know. Um, maybe we won Haiti, you know. Uh, but we haven't really won a war. We haven't won a war in the Middle East, for sure. And this was an example of, you know, what did um, uh, Santayana say? You know, he who ignores history is doomed to repeat it. And I, I don't think they teach history enough at West Point and Annapolis. Um, I, think, I think we, you know, we played the same tune uh, in Afghanistan that we played in Vietnam. We, we lied to the public. Uh, we had no clear mission. Um, and we failed. And as time went on, it was more and more clear that we failed, and then we could not you know, gracefully extract ourselves. Bottom line is uh, our military, our military initiatives uh, really haven't improved since Vietnam, and Afghanistan was a good example of that. Um, and I guess you could, you know, you could blame it on whatever president, whatever presidents were in office at the time, but it's really a military question, it's a political question, and it's a public question. You know, the U.S. always has this recalcitrant isolation, isola isolationist default. And they, you know, they played in, and that played in both, both wars. We could have and should have done a better job, both in Vietnam and in Afghanistan. And I think at the end of the day, we just threw money at it um, and, and we lost it. And we lost so many lives, 50, 50 some odd thousand lives. In, in Vietnam. So, you know, it's hard to argue with uh, Joe Biden when he wants to get out. I mean, it's a good policy decision, um, but there are problems that will follow. Um, and, um, you know, in, in Vietnam, they, you know, the North Vietnamese closed it down. 
and they built the they built the country. You got to give them credit; they built the country, and now things are pretty sweet. It's still communist, but it's sweeter by far than people expected. And query whether you know that is going to happen in Afghanistan. <laughs> the problem in Afghanistan, <clears throat> and we should talk about it sometime in this show, is the geopolitical forces that um, you know could come from other nations who do not wish the United States well. So Russia is a factor. Iran is a factor. You know, other nations that would give them nuclear weapons and weapons of all kinds, those are factors. And um, those guys would love to see nothing more, um, you know, than a rogue nation emerge in Afghanistan. And so really the question looking forward is whether we're going to have a rogue nation or a responsible nation. And the chances are, it'll be rogue, not necessarily because that will be in its best interest, but because there'll be forces applied to Afghanistan now from other rogue nations that will encourage it. So the more we turn our backs on it, the more we refuse to give them their, their funding, uh, the more we don't help them and criticize them and call them names, the more likely it is that other rogue nations will make them a rogue nation. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think- Well, let me draw a parallel, couple parallels. Parallels are, parallels are clear. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> many of them. And, and if we fail to recognize them, we're doomed to repeat them. I mean, <clears throat> in Vietnam, we had Daniel Ellsberg, uh, you know, release the Pentagon Papers. Clearly in the Pentagon Papers, it reflected that General Westmoreland and, and Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, were basically covering up the fact that we are losing the war. Uh, they hid numbers. They 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 said everything's going well. Um, you know, they lied to Congress. And what do we have now? We have the Afghanistan papers, where we have uh, Petraeus putting on a spin that really wasn't there. And, and so, how do we avoid once we're embroiled and enmeshed in you know the fog of war? How do we how do we keep it from the the generals from putting a, a happy face on it? And maybe it's political. Maybe the presidents uh, that serve at that time say, I don't want to hear any bad news. So uh, they don't want to give any bad news. How do we avoid that, that being enmeshed with uh, public relations on how the war is really going versus how they want to be perceived how it's going? Well, they have to be honest. I think Biden is basically honest, uh, but you can't guarantee that in a president. You, you, and you can't guarantee that in the chiefs of staff. They, you know, they are inclined to tell him what he wants to hear. But, you know, all of this, you have to wrap around the notion uh, that the people, you know, the public, they, they don't want to be disappointed. They want to have good news. And the press wants to give them good news. And, and then, the, uh, but the press loves raw meat. The press was so quick to criticize Biden about the evacuation. You know, it's, it's almost as, oh, let's go back to the good old days with Trump. Uh, it was incredible the way they attacked him. And I say to myself, you know, if the press is going to do that, um, then it encourages lying, doesn't it? Um, we all have to be honest, and the press has to be honest, and, it, and the press cannot go for raw meat all the time, because if you do that, then you actually encourage lying. And I think that happened in Vietnam, and it certainly happened here in Afghanistan. So we, we all have to develop a more sophisticated view of these things. It's not just the president. It's not just the chief of staff. It's, it's everybody, it's the public needs to be better informed in general about how this kind of thing works. And the press has to be more, mm, well, I don't know what the right word for this, uh, Winston will have the right word. The press has to be more ah, tolerant, conciliatory, understanding, instead of looking to criticize somebody. And of course, you know, one of the factors about criticism is that we have a divided nation and we really can't help that right now. Um, and, and the Republicans are going to take every opportunity to criticize Biden about everything. You know, McCarthy gets up there and socks him with public criticism. Would you, would you expect anything else? I would faint if he said, oh, Joe, Joe Biden did a good job. I would faint right on the floor um, because the, the Republicans are going to take every opportunity. So we as a nation, really, if we're going to handle this going forward, if we're going to be an effective world policeman or whatever we want to be, we have to be together about it. We can't be fighting with ourselves all the time. Good point. Hey, Winston, um, do you draw parallels that what we've experienced in the last 20 years in Afghanistan, 
Do you draw parallels to what we experienced for our 13, 14 years in Vietnam? You know, Vietnam is for, I think, most Americans, ancient history, uh, like World War II, is quickly fading into the past where uh, folks of a certain age, I, I, I think if you asked most uh, kids under 25 or 30, if they even knew that America was fighting in, in Afghanistan today, or if I mean it's 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 a reality that you if you ask them who we were fighting in World War II, sizable numbers don't know who the the difference between the Axis and the Allied powers are. Uh, you know the the Korea Vietnam, these were, you know uh, Jay meant you mentioned about which war did we win? How about Granada? Um, uh, I think you know we won that one pretty well of in the, in the Reagan era. The reality is this war is not what it used to be. In the olden days, the reason why we went in Afghanistan and the reason why we stayed very complex, Joe Biden, I think, is doing, um, you know, what he can, which is the, the will of the people saying we don't need to be in this country anymore. We, we cannot win this war or whatever you call can, it. Can I interrupt you for a moment, Winston? Absolutely. You know, we've all been using the word war. You've used it. Tim has used it. I've used it. And the press has certainly used it. But war? What is war? You know, we went in there in order to deal with uh, Al Qaeda, um, and okay, that was uh, that was uh, effective at least for the first year. But war? We haven't made war on them. They've made war on us. Where then with their explosive devices and ambushing our troops? We never we never went after them nearly so much as they went after us. So I'm not even sure I call this a war. It's something else, but it's not it's not a war in the conventional sense. It's not a war in the conventional sense, but whatever it is, it's people shooting at each other, killing, being maimed and, and dying. And uh, so whatever we call it or don't call it, I think Americans overwhelmingly did support the withdrawal of American troops from this region, realizing that it's a quagmire that will never be solved. It, it's it's the you know, the graveyard of empires uh, and. and I don't. I I would disagree, though, with your premise that they want a rogue state there. I don't think that's in anyone's interest. It's not in Pakistan's interest, China's interest, Iran's interest. Um, you know, it, it it may be. It it seems like North Korea is a bit of an interesting foil for for the Chinese and uh, to have as a sort of a bargaining chip. And uh, on some level, it's uh, why else would they tolerate it there? Uh, but I don't think that's going to be the case. So we we'll see that in Afghanistan. However, what's the solution? no large power has been able to go in there and subjugate these very different groups of, of, of tribes and, and, and ethnic divisions inside of uh, this country that we call Afghanistan. But in fact, it's many different um, nations inside of this country. And I think that it will be interesting to see, you mentioned about Vietnam coming along 20 years from now. If you were to go into Saigon or Hanoi, you would be surprised at obviously the level of of what we would see is just corporate capitalism there uh, as, as uh, they produce immense quantities of, of things that the world wants to buy. So it, it may have a, a single political party, um, but I don't know that we're going to be able to expect that from Afghanistan. But let's see what 20 years of having some some sort of, uh, of, of you know, Western presence that, that, that we had in Afghanistan brings about. However, I, I wouldn't remain that optimistic. You know, look at when was the revolution in Iran, 1978, 79, something like that. Uh, you know, most of the young people in that country as well don't remember a time when the Shah was there. This is a young nation. We're going to see the same thing in Afghanistan that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, the kids won't have a memory of that. But all of them will have a cell phone guarantee you in the smallest village they will start they they will have to change because they'll realize if we don't we will have failed our people see you're seeing this even in in, in, in cuba so the world's going to change as it changes as we bring back our troops it's going to be easy to to uh with the 2020s or, you know, look back and say oh you you should have done this that and the other and absolutely is there room for criticism on the way that this happened should they have seen that the uh, government that the military there would have fallen so instantly, probably um, it's one scenario, but we've had spectacular intelligence failures in the past. And uh, I think probably, you know, leading up to 911 that and, and from then on. But uh, we've had amazing uh, intelligence that tells us things that 
that 99% of it we don't hear about that are victories, that are wins, that are that are watching things from the sky and, and on the internet and other places and human intelligence. So uh, we don't know about those things and we don't hear about those things. Uh, however- Let me ask you this. Um, we're not done with Afghanistan. Although we saw the last plane fly out, we still have one to 200 Americans and we have countless of Afghan um, allies that didn't get out. So the question is, to what degree do we work with the Taliban and incentivize them or whatever arrangements we have? Now, clearly they were helping, believe it or not, they were helping Americans get to the checkpoints, get to the airport, uh, to the point where uh, some of the news services were reporting they were carrying their luggage for them. Um, to what degree do we engage with the Taliban, our, our enemy today, but potential partner tomorrow? to combat ISIS-K and uh, other, other groups. You know, the, there's so many, as you said, there's so many tribes here that you don't know who's against who on what particular day. The Mujahideen has sworn uh, that the Taliban is their, their enemy and they will begin to take action against the Taliban. Um, do, does the Taliban become now our on the, on the, on the ground uh, ally? It should, it should. Um, because uh, that, that avoids the, the risk of it going rogue. It avoids the risk of uh, atrocities and war crimes, or at least it minimizes it. It makes them a responsible member of the community of nations. Uh, they're not organized. Uh, there's this guy, Barasada, who seems to be emerging, and he seems to be civilized, although he talks about the, uh, the Shia, Shia law, which is a dangerous thing for any country. Um, on the, you know, my, my feeling is that it's in the United States' best interest to deal with them, not only to get the 100 Americans out and other people out, um, but to make them a responsible, accountable member of society, of the, of the global society. Um, and I think there's a possibility there because they really do want to rule the place. They don't know how. They need, they need to be left to their uh, most civilized inclinations and do that. And they could be very successful the way Vietnam has been. Take a while. Okay, well, let me, let me, very, let me interject very, something. Let me interject yeah. something here. Why couldn't that have been done 20 years ago, 19 years ago, uh, before the invasion, to try to work with a, uh, you know, a tribal group and avoid the 20, all the death and mayhem that's transpired in 20 years? Why can that, through diplomacy, those efforts take place before war is declared? Well, we, didn't, we weren't smart. We weren't smart. We considered them adversaries, and uh, and we weren't going to give them a break about anything. They were our enemy, and nobody was going to make an effort to be conciliatory with them. I don't think there was any conciliation, uh, but there could be now. And um, you know, the problem the problem is a political problem, because the Republicans will criticize that. Um, I think a lot of people in the military, you know, will criticize that, and they. Like it or not, they have a voice in politics. Um, the, the GOP in general, the right side of things, will criticize that. Biden, Biden will have a political problem if he tries to uh, sidle up to them and, and make deals with them. On the other hand, he's the president. He can do it. Um, and my advice to him would be to, to start early and to develop diplomatic connections with them, um, to show them the way to uh, being responsible leaders, uh, to cooperate with them. And, and in that way, they won't become, uh, you know, colonies of China or Russia or Iran. Uh, we, we want them to have a viable government, and hopefully we can help them better from the outside than from the inside, you know, in a, in a warlike fashion. Much better to try diplomacy. And I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, they established kind of temporary diplomatic agency in, in Doha. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm happy that there's at least some connection going on. I'm, I'm happy that Burns of the National Security, was it, or CIA, went in there and talked to Barasada. So there are already connections here. Biden has to play it carefully. Uh, Tony uh, Blinken has to play it carefully. But that is the mission now. And we should be much smarter now than we were before. Winston, do you agree with Jay's position that it is a wise decision to try to work with the Taliban and uh, have them as an uneasy ally, but an ally nevertheless? 
I don't know about ally, but at least um, not adversary. And I think we've, we've already seen this, uh, that as Jay said, they're carrying luggage. Uh, thank you very much. Get out of our country. We'll help you load the plane. Now it's not been that smooth or easy or simple, but uh, essentially, you know, these, these peace negotiations or withdrawal negotiations, whatever you want to call them, that started in the, the, the Trump years, they, uh, you know, Qatar was a big facilitator of those. And if you're coming from, you know, a mud shack where you have to worry about being bombed all the time and you get to go stay at the, uh, the, the, the Hyatt Regency in, in, uh, in, in Doha and, and have all the, the, you know, beautiful luxuries that, that that society is able to provide its citizens, I think any normal person would say, I would like this for my country too. And this can be achieved with peace and with development and with cooperation with the rest of the world. It helps, you know, the Qatar is sitting on a ton of oil too. But the idea is that 98 nations came together and made an arrangement to facilitate getting out people that still need to be gotten out. That's a huge coalition right there of people and, and that the Taliban were willing to, to deal with. So, uh, you know, this was a, a negotiated withdrawal. It was, was it done perfectly? No. Was it done uh, well? No. But we're still going to see a lot of movement out of the country, dribs and drabs. You're going to have the diaspora of uh, Afghanis around the world who are then going to contribute back into the society, maybe similar, and that might be the parallel, Jay, is, is as, as they have gone abroad, then they will continue their relations inside of the country and rebuild from overseas with new ideas, with new technologies, with, uh, with connections from overseas so that they can build up their country into something that resembles, uh, you know, where Vietnam is today. And uh, that would be the hope that we have. And of course, we have to engage with them uh, if, if we're, you know, to hold up our, our, our best vision and values for the world as well. Well, okay. the, the dark you know, we got side a question, that, Tim. The dark side of that is that if we don't, if we turn our backs on them, if we continue in our isolationist uh, approach to things, um, we won't have the benefit of any of that. And uh, they will be dangerous to us. So I don't. Really well, Russia think... and China have already recognized them as a as a, a valid uh, holder of the government of Afghanistan, and that's so on the already... surface. You can imagine what's going on under the surface. Correct. So uh, it's a it's a race um, to see who can be more um, conciliatory with them right now. We should not lose the opportunity. Okay. Hey, we got a question from a viewer here, and I, we appreciate every question we get. And this one is uh, to you, Winston. Do you think the private sector soldiers should start missions to extract people stuck in Afghanistan? And what sort of problems could those contractors create? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot. There's some movies on Netflix that show stuff like that. Um, I, you know, however, these however we get out our allies and our friends that have been there that are trapped and that are facing, uh, you know, really bad fates. We need to do all we can to bring them out, whether it's uh, negotiations with the Taliban, whether it's, you know, cash payments, whatever it is that that it is to take them out or or organized caravans. And it seems like, you know, the Taliban has a couple of choices here. I would if I were starting a nation afresh. Well, do you want an entire brain drain of people that that have connections and and uh, with 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 the external community of the, the world or are they going to be an irritant in your side as you try to form your new society under your own values and mores? So uh, they're facing that question. And I think they're probably going to let the people go uh, to a certain point. And that's going to be easier for them rather than facing constant internal division. They're going to have enough of that, like you said, with the uh, Mujahideen and, uh, and others uh, in their country. But they may also say, no, uh, we need all of you to stay here in this society. But I, I have a feeling like uh, they're just going to say, let the, let the folks go. And they have been letting them go until now. I don't know what's going to happen in the next week. And I would hope that all of the marginalized people uh, that would be victims of this, uh, the worst victims of this regime, and obviously you can't depopulate half the nation of all the women that are going to be suffering here. But there's a lot of other groups that really need to be taken out, the translators, uh, the helpers for Americans, uh, any LGBTQ folks, uh, if they can't even be recognized. I don't know how we, we even undertake some of these things, any you know, other religious minorities and, and whatnot. So we've got even that the, they left the dogs behind, I, I read in one of them uh, for the military dogs. So, you know, you've got uh, 
uh, a lot of cleanup to do and it's not going to happen right now we're just going to have to see how this thing unfolds and uh, that's it well there is 1.2 trillion dollar uh in a federal reserve bank in the united states uh with afghan's name on it and i'm sure that has some influence so we'll see how that how that plays out hey jay we got a second question here and that is would have made a difference if Donald Trump had not let out the prisoners uh, of all these soldiers that basically, basically has taken 20 years to round up. They were let go. And is, yeah, we did it so back in March of 2020, talking about how they're probably have been released before the ink was even dried on the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the agreement between the Taliban. Um, Donald Trump uh, was completely incompetent. Uh, in uh, a commander in chief things, in handling the joint chiefs, and certainly in diplomatic relations. In fact, I would say it was, it's worse than incompetent. What is worse than incompetent? I mean, it's corrupt incompetence. So uh, I don't give him credit for anything. Um, on the other hand, uh, to answer this question, I'm not sure it would have made a big difference because if the country was going to collapse anyway, they would get out. It was just a matter of time. They would get out. They would be out now for sure. Uh, I want to. Well, add I guess uh, maybe the uh, there's an inference there that maybe other than Taliban released, maybe there was ISIS involved in those prisons as well. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's true. Um, I think mostly we were looking for Taliban and we put Taliban in jail. ISIS. Um, the, it's very interesting that you mentioned ISIS because. The, the only real violence in the past two weeks has been by ISIS. And arguably, the Taliban can't control ISIS. They're their own, their own crazy people. Um, and and uh, you know, it was not the Taliban that did that violence. It was not the Taliban that, that you know, blew up anybody. And you, you have to make that separate. I thought a lot of the criticism that, that Biden got was because of that um, you know, terrorism. But that wasn't the Taliban. Um, furthermore, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was some thing about how um, the Biden administration had cut a deal to extend the August 31 date in order to permit more people to come out. But the Biden administration decided that they were they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. They weren't going to accept that deal, even though they made the deal uh, and they brought them out by August 31. As a matter of fact, by August 30th, which I thought was interesting. They beat their own deadline. Um, that, that was really very cautious on the part of the, um, of the Joint Chiefs. And I think uh, what you have here is a, an inflexibility, perhaps. Uh, they were like, paranoid, not necessarily because of the lives involved, but because of the public reaction and the GOP criticism. So I'm not sure the Taliban is all as bad as we, as we think. Uh, with that 1.2 billion, did you say? Uh, trillion, trillion. trillion. What 1.2 trillion? trillion. That's, right, trillion. Um, that 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 is a big bargaining chip. They don't have to let it all out, but they could certainly, as Winston suggested, they could let a little of it out and uh, and and buy some buy some peace and quiet, buy buy some uh, further evacuation. I think that's obvious and easy. In fact, I think that's what's going to happen. And I think well, that's part of the right approach because uh, money does talk in this context. Yeah, hey, uh, we're almost out of time. But Winston, does the Taliban even survive as ruling the government or are they overrun by um, other tribal groups or ISIS-K? Uh, your thoughts about the viability of Taliban to even stay in power? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question, but uh, you know, we hope that that there's some stability in there. We don't want a failed state in complete chaos. That's that doesn't help anybody. Um, you know, I, I just my, my my heart would goes out to the, all the the U.S. soldiers, especially who have been sent to Afghanistan over the years and um, and fought for uh, what we what they were sent there for. And 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 that's a lot of that is confusing right now. And probably some of them are wondering what what was I doing there. But I think it's you know, we were trying to help this nation on some level and and provide uh, people with a sense of peace and justice. And so the sacrifices that they've made and that they continue to make, um, and as they've come back, uh, you know, we support our, our military and, 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 and the good men and women who staff that. 
and also for all the people in Af Afghanistan right now who are uh, undoubtedly living in a state of pure terror about what the future uh, will bring. Uh, so, you know, hopefully uh, we will engage with them. We will do the right thing as best as we can. Uh, our government will do the best that it can uh, as it withdraws from this quagmire of 20 years. And uh, let's hope that a bunch of calm comes on that nation. We've got enough to deal with right here at home. Um, so maybe without Afghanistan um, taking any um, attention, uh, and it needs a lot of attention right now, we've got a lot to focus on right here. Those are great final words, Winston. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful and very sage. Jay, your, your final thoughts and um, uh, closing remarks? We really have to learn from what happened in Afghanistan. You know, not even getting to the question of comparing it with Vietnam. We have to learn how to deal with um, the, the kind of problem we found in Afghanistan, with the kind of challenges we had in uh, its infrastructure. Remember, it was really a primitive society. Uh, I remember looking at the, um, you know, at the uh, website to, I said, who, who does this? I think the CIA has a website. It's public about every country. And they had something like 11 miles of railroad in the whole country with the 38, 40 million people. Uh, anyway, we have to learn how to deal with this. We made a lot of mistakes. We put contractors in there to do things. They were not really responsible. They were not really citizen diplomats. Um, we, we put contractors in there to do fighting. Uh, and, and we lost control of the situation. We just threw money at it without having a long range plan. Next time we have to do way, way better. And we have to know how to get out. We have to know what our mission is. We should have been out of there in a year or two, not, not waiting 20 years. So um, somebody ought to write a book, uh, maybe Winston. Winston, you should write a book about the lessons that we have to apply next time around. The reality is from a moral point of view, this will happen again. And people will call upon the United States as a, either a good leader or not so good leader, a global leader, to deal as the world's policeman. And we should be the world's policeman. Nobody else can do it in, a, in the high moral aspect of, of how we think, or at least how some of us think. So bottom line is um, this ought to be a learning experience and we'll, we'll have to do better and uh, we should start doing better now. Well, when we get that call from another nation, and you're right, Jay, it will happen. Hopefully we remember the two words that are paramount, and that is mission creep. And hopefully we avoid 20 year engagements because we know our mission, the scope of the mission and the objectives, and we stick to it. So Jay Fidel, thank you very much for joining us. Winston Welch, thank you for joining us for What Now America? Join us next week at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Until then, aloha. Thank you.